started this morning at the back of the church if you want some uh, caffeine. Uh, that's certainly something that helps us out on a rainy day. If you feel like coloring today, there's no age qualifier on that. We have coloring sheets and crayons over on the side uh, if you guys want to track along uh, with something through that in the, uh, for our service today. And also we have these cups uh, on the side as well on the way in too, communion cups. If you want to join us in the Lord's Supper, uh, if you're a follower of Jesus and want to join us in communion, you're more than welcome uh, to do that as well too. At every church in the world, they will all tell you, doesn't matter if they're big or medium-sized or large, there's always needs with volunteers and helpers and people to get involved. Uh, we have needs at our church right now with people who can help out with our media team. Uh, we have guys who do such an awesome job every Sunday helping out with our media, and we would love to add people to that team uh, because, uh, you know, they do a great job, and we just want to be able to help them out with that. And also, we need help with our greeters as well, too, on Sunday morning. So if you want to stand by the door and high-five people, whatever you want to do, just to make them feel welcome and a part of our service, uh, that's certainly something that would be a great help uh, to our, our church as well, too. Well, we're about to get started with worship today. Before we get started, I just want to pray for us at the beginning of our service today. God, we want to thank you that we are here for a new day, that we are here uh, to, again, just to celebrate you in worship, to just to be joyful for how you've made us, to be joyful for the way that you've made for us uh, in Jesus. And we pray that as we worship today, as we uh, open in the word today, that you would speak to us, that you would help us to connect through the songs and worship today, and that it doesn't matter what's going on outside, no matter what the weather's like, uh, God, you've certainly thrilled our hearts and made us alive with everything that you've done for us. So let's like make that the focus of our day as we just get ready to worship you and praise you for who you are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. A small group here, but that's okay. We can still, uh, it's a morning that we get to spend together and worship God through song and prayer, through scripture, teaching. Um, and for those who are joining us from home as well, just a special welcome as well. My name is Christy, if you don't know me, and I am on staff here as well, and uh, I just want to read um, a few verses from Psalm chapter 50 as our call to worship this morning. I heard this verse earlier this week, and it, I just thought it was beautiful, and I, I just want to read that for us this morning. The Lord, the Mighty One, is God. And he has spoken. He has summoned all humanity from where the sun rises to where it sets. From Mount Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines in glorious radiance. Our God approaches, and he is not silent. Let's pray. God, Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the, the things that we see as we look around us that show us that you are God, that, that you are in control, that you are moving and doing beautiful things in our midst, whether it is looking at creation whether it's looking at the sunrise or the sunset or as new growth is happening uh, with the spring season, or whether it's through people and things that people do, kind things, um, things to help someone smile, a conversation. God, thank you for the ways that you move and the things that you do 
to show us that you are here, you are present, you are in control, you love us. God, thank you for the ways that you show us. God, we want to just worship you today. We have come to worship you today, together. And I thank you for that. And as we, as we begin this time together, God, I pray that what we offer you here this morning would honor you, that it would please you, that that is our hope. But we also, God, we want to invite you to, to speak to us today and to remind us of what it is that, that you want to say to each one of us. And God, I just pray that, uh, that each one of us would... Um, just have a spirit to hear what it is that you, that, what you have to say to us today. Thank you for who you are. And uh, yeah, we just want to give you this time. In your name I pray. Amen. So let's sing together. Why don't you stand with me and let's sing some songs together.
Thanks, Christy, for leading us in worship this morning. Always do such a great job every week. We're just so grateful for you. You know what, guys? It's a bit of a rainy day. It's a bit of a blah day. Let's take a quick moment and do a meet and greet. Come on, let's get up. Let's get each other going here. It's not a nice day outside. We've got to be nice to each other. Handshakes, hugs, all that good stuff. Come on, let's go. Elbow feels good now. Thank you. Good morning. I'll do your seat. Good to see you. Such a tough game this week. That was good. I just felt like we needed that. <laughs> All right, let me pray for us. We'll get started. I'm very excited today as we get into God's Word. Uh, let's hear what He has for us today. And uh, as always, we always have the, uh, the hope of the gospel to look forward to hearing. Uh, so let's pray. Uh, God, we thank you that today is May 1st. Today is a Sunday, and we get to be here all together with our church family. We thank you so much for every person, for every heart that's here. And everyone who's checking us out online now or later, we pray that their heart is blessed uh, by uh, seeing our service as well too. So as we sing, as we worship, as we hear uh, what you're speaking to us through your word, we pray that our hearts are opened and receptive and connected to you today. We ask this in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Well, a few years ago, uh, the authors Dan and Chip Heath uh, wrote a book called Switch, How to Change, when, How to Change Things When Things Are Hard. Uh, over the last couple of years, this has gone on to be a bestseller, uh, helping people how to move forward in situations, whether, whether it's with work or whether it's with business, where it looks like the situation in front of us is unsolvable. So it's been a really great, really helpful book that way. Uh, the book is filled with amazing stories about people who, without much power, without much money, without much leverage at their disposal, who, despite all of this, were able to create huge chances and changes in their businesses, hospitals, and in the case of the St. Lucia Parrot, an entire island nation. You see, the island of St. Lucia had a problem. The St. Lucia parrot was almost extinct through a combination of habitat destruction, hunters and poachers, and there was only 100 of the birds still alive in 1977 when the head of the St. Lucia Forestry Service hired a guy named Paul Butler to solve the problem. So their national bird, there's 100 of them left, and they hire a guy who just finished graduating from college with a wealth of lifetime experience and professional experience to solve the problem. So Butler's job was simple. He had a few hundred dollars, no real connections, no real power. He was from the UK. He wasn't even from St. Lucia, and he was asked to save the bird from extinction. Oh, and by the way, virtually none of the, none of the people in St. Lucia actually cared about the parrot. Uh, they thought that uh, in most cases, the St. Lucian parrot was good for eating as opposed to conserving. <laughs> but no problem, right? Butler had this experience. He had spent a grand total of five weeks in St. Lucia. Everything should work out just fine. And amazingly, it did. There was this amazing turnaround with it. 
So with hundreds of dollars, he got the St. Lucians to affirm the fact that they were the kind of people who, quote unquote, take care of their own. And so he kind of started this word of mouth promotion. He's like, yeah, we're from St. Lucia, right? Like you guys take care of your own, right? Oh yeah, of course we do. That's something that we do. And so he organized these public events. He distributed t-shirts. He got local bands to write songs about the parrot. <laughs> he convinced hotels to print up bumper stickers. He had volunteers dress up like the parrot and talked about kids in school about how important it is that we preserve this, this bird. And he even asked pastors in local churches to quote relevant scriptures on preserving the environment and on stewardship. So in short, he was able to convince the St. Lucians that this parrot was part of their identity. And as part of their identity, they had to protect it. So what was the result? Well, the population of St. Lucia parrots rose from 100 in 1977 to 700 five years later, also unheard of as growth with an endangered species. And so the parrot was taken off the endangered list and people were encouraged to see that their identity as a people who take care of their own was a successful campaign. Their identity change led to a behavior change. Think about that last line. Their be identity change led to a behavior change. Well, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we also have an identity change that leads to a behavior change. For Christians, we undergo a complete spiritual identity change when we respond to the love that God shows us, as was expressed when we read John 3.16 last week as a church family. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. His love for everyone, when Jesus died for the sins of the world, was on full display. It was a love that was expressed, that died to cover and conquer all our sins and failures. It's a love that transfers us from spiritual life into from spiritual death into spiritual life. So if you're transferred from spiritual death to spiritual life, that is a complete and major change in your identity. And it is also the place where our spiritual journey begins. Oh my goodness, not this guy again. I don't want to dance with this stand again. I do this every time. So this week we're continuing in our series called Life is a Journey. Because the Christian life has been described as a journey. It's a journey that begins with faith. It's a faith that's a trust in God. It's a faith that's a trust in what God has for us. It's a tr faith that's a trust in what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And when you're on a faith journey, there are all kinds of things that can happen along the way. If you talk to somebody who has been a follower of Jesus for a long time, and you ask them, how has it gone over the years when you followed Jesus, you're going to get a lot of stories about things that they didn't expect to happen happening, about challenges to their faith have happening that they didn't expect, of all kinds of obstacles that they didn't expect to have happen along the way. You go through different seasons in the Christian life as well, too. Sometimes things are going well and everything's, well, not, not spring, everything's summer, because we have a confused spring, but everything's summer and beautiful at certain times in your spiritual life. Sometimes things are like winter, it's cold, it's difficult, it's tough, it's hard. But either way, all along the way in our faith journey, Jesus is with us all along the way. A few years ago, I ran into a friend of mine who I used to play high school soccer with. So he was um, a really good soccer player. He scored a lot of goals for us. And um, well, I was in the back, I played defense. So I wasn't very good. <laughs> so we ran into each other uh, at this store and we started talking about how our lives had changed over the last 10 years since we'd each known each other's teammates. And so we do what everybody else does when you're reconnecting with people. You talk about your life changes, you talk about the cities you've moved to, you talk about how your jobs have changed. 
And so I asked him, he asked me, so what do you do now? And I said, well, I'm a pastor at a church, and it's going really great. I love it. It's a great job. And I said to him, and he said to me as a response, he said, really? You're a pastor of a church. Because that's interesting, because recently I've become a Christian myself. And I was excited to hear this, because this, this isn't normally what you hear from people when you're catching up with them after a 10-year time span. So I asked him all kinds of questions, like, what led to this happening in your life? Uh, what were the questions that you worked through? Who were the people that helped you along? What were all these things that happened? I had so many questions. And he said to me, look, I, I don't know the exact moment. I don't know the exact place. I don't know when everything clicked. I don't know the exact conversation. But this is what I know for sure where I am right now. And that is that Jesus has changed me. That's what I know. And as Christians, I wonder sometimes if we've made it too hard, if we've made it a little bit too complicated. Because one of the amazing claims and truths that we stand on and that we trust in every day is that we've been changed, is that God has changed us. And if you're a newer Christian, you're noticing in your life right now that God has moved into your life and he's created some changes. Your heart is changing. The way you think about things is changing. If you're an experienced Christian, God is still looking to change you. He's still looking to help you grow. He's still looking to help you become more like Jesus. And he doesn't place any age limits on anything either. So if you're 8 or 88, he's looking for you to grow and to become more like him. He's still incredibly patient and loving and gracious to us all the way through every season of our lives along the way in the journey. And you know what? If you're not a Christian, if you're asking questions, if you're still trying to figure out, I just want to say, man, it's just so awesome that you're here this morning. It's so great that you're checking it out. We're just honored that you're here and that you've decided to check things out with us and spend the morning with us today. And our hope is, as a church, is that you see the change that's evident in our lives as well, too. We've been changed, and changed people live in a changed way. And this shouldn't surprise us. This is why change has happened in our life. The first point is, is because at one point in time, you were separated from God. This is why we see amazing change that's happened in our life when we believed in Jesus. Formerly, you were not in a relationship with God, and now you are in a relationship with God. Before, you were in a state of spiritual death, and now, because you believe in Jesus, you're in a state of spiritual life through him. So, of course, my life as a believer is going to be different because my source of spiritual life is completely different than it was before. Not sure how many of you guys hang out on uh, social media, you watch different things, maybe you're on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. Um, one of the things that you may have noticed recently in the last couple months is that there's, there's a, um, oh, what's the word for it? I don't have the word, I don't know what the word is right now. Oh, I don't like it when this happens. But basically what you see is you see between a lot of the, the social media outlets is you see a lot of them funneling into each other. So you're on Facebook and then you get stuff from TikTok or you get stuff from Instagram, and it, and it funnels over. There's, there's um, Cross-pollination is not the word, <laughs> but that's the idea of what's happening. And it's fascinating because the other day I was looking for a quote on something, and I'm on Instagram, and there's all these stories that are being fed in, transferred in from TikTok. And what it is, is it's story after story after story of people talking about the change that's been happening in their life because they've just come to having new faith in Jesus. And what they do that's so powerful visually is they show something that was a part of their life before they came to know Jesus. And then this is what's happening now when they talk about their new faith in Jesus. And it doesn't mean that all their problems are gone. It doesn't mean that everything's fixed and tucked away nicely and neatly. But it shows this incredible change 
Because you have kids on TikTok talking about what's been going on in their lives and how much Jesus has changed them. This one kid's like, I was a, a, a Satanist, and now my life has completely changed, and now I'm a Christian, now I'm a believer. And it's com- you don't even think it's the same person. It looks so different. It's amazing. Or one person saying, you know, I used to throw myself into relationships endlessly, and now I'm at peace because I have faith in Jesus. I have a recognition of my dignity and the great worth that God gives to me. Or I used to be depressed because the pandemic was so hard on us. I used to feel everything was hopeless. I was nihilistic. And now I have faith in what Jesus is doing in my life. Or I used to be heavy into the drug scene, and now I'm clean. Now things are going in the right direction because of the change that Jesus has brought into my life. What is part of your story? What is the but Jesus part of your story? It doesn't have to be this big, dramatic change like some of the stories that we hear. But think back in your life and how much of a difference Jesus has made because he's changed you. It's an amazing thing. It reminds me of this verse from the Bible where the Apostle Paul is looking back in Colossians 1 of where we were before and where we are now because of the amazing changing work of Jesus in our life. Colossians 1, verses 21 to 22 says, Once you were separated from God, the evil things you did showed your hostile attitude. And here's the but now. But now Christ has brought you back to God by dying in his physical body. He did this so you could come into God's presence without sin, without fault, or blame. And you know, there's, there's joy, there's appreciation when you come to have faith in Jesus. And I know at this church, I've heard so many of the stories of people here of the amazing difference that Jesus has made in our lives. And you just love to keep hearing these stories over and over again because we'll never stop being moved, we'll never stop being amazed to see what happens when Jesus gets a hold of somebody's life and brings them from a state of being in spiritual death into spiritual life. The second thing that we've come to understand because we've been changed is that we certainly understood repentance. We certainly understood repentance. Repentance is a word that has sometimes taken some people off guard because it sounds like it's just a really spiritual, religious word. Uh, Maybe you were caught off guard by someone who was really yelling a lot, screaming a lot. Maybe it was on the street. Maybe it was a televangelist or somebody who you saw who was telling you that you needed to repent. But at the very base of this word, repent, because it was something that Jesus told people to do a lot too, is that it's a word that very simply means to change your mind. And we have change in our life because I changed my thinking about who Jesus is and what he did. Acts 3.19 says, repent then and turn to God. Here's the turn. So that your sins may be wiped out, the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The word that the Bible uses to describe this spiritual transfer of coming from life to death is the word conversion. And when you experience a conversion, you experience a complete spiritual identity change. You know, one of the things that I didn't have a very good grasp on earlier in my life is that when I came to Christ, when I became a Christian, I kind of thought that that God loved me, that he forgave my sins, and then through the rest of the week and through everything else that I'm doing, That's kind of like my time. That's kind of like my opportunity to do whatever I'm doing. And then on Sunday, I kind of refocus and I come back to that. But that's not what Jesus wants from us. When Jesus looks at every single one of us, he says to us, I want all of your heart. I want 100% of you. I don't just want your attention on Sunday. Man, I died for you. I love you. I want all of your heart. That's what I died for. That's what I gave my life for. 
when he looked at every single one of us who's here this morning, God said, I want all of this person's heart. I want all of them. Because when they change their mind, when they turn to me, that's what I want. I don't just want you on Sunday. I want to keep walking with you on this journey through every day of your life. The third thing that we've come to understand by being changed is that an identity change leads to a behavior change. In the Bible, in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul looks at how we as believers in Jesus Christ are changed and continue to change. The New Translation puts it this way. He says, since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. I just want to read that again because there's a lot in there. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. You know, we go through the Easter season, moved to worship, moved to appreciate everything that Jesus has done for us. But we don't go through the Easter season seeing how we're actually connected to everything that Jesus has done for us and how that actually shapes and changes who we are as believers on a daily basis. Do you guys, do you guys see what I mean here? Do you, see, do you see what I mean when I'm saying this? It's like, I feel like this is one of the traps of any kind of holiday season. On Good Friday, we say, man, wow, that's, that's so bad what Jesus went through for me. That's so difficult what he went through for me. On Easter Sunday, we, we push that aside. And we're filled with hope and we're singing. We think that it's great. But here Paul is saying, listen, this is kind of difficult to understand. And even people with great theology degree, degrees still can't explain this in a really straightforward and plain way. But here's the thing that we all need to take away. What Jesus died for, what he was raised for, and what he accomplished. Every person who calls himself a Christian is spiritually connected to that work. That's amazing. And that's why Paul goes on to say, because he is raised, we will be raised too. And so it's not just thinking, thanks, Jesus, that was great. Now I'm going to do everything that I want over here. But now it's not like, no, I'm going to walk with Jesus. I'm going to cultivate my relationship with him. I'm going to be changed by him every day because of everything that he's accomplished for me so that now we can live new lives. Look again, this time with the message helping us with this Romans 6 passage. Paul says, so what do we do? Do we just keep on sinning so we can, God can keep on forgiving? I should hope not. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house here? Or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That's what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind. And when we came out of the water, we entered the new country of grace a new life, in a new land. Identity change. Becoming a child of God goes hand in hand with behavior change. And whatever we do now as followers of Jesus, we're doing it now because we're people whose lives have been completely different. It's not because it's the right thing to do, 
but we do it because by listening to God and doing what he says, we actually grow and experience God, God's goodness through it. So what does this new life look like? Well, very simply, I've probably used this phrase before, but he, very simply, the way that a changed life looks is that we take root and we bear fruit. We live the life of discipleship, and then we live a life of following and listening and obeying to God. Jesus said in Mark 8, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. The Christian life isn't us trying to get God to validate who we are, what our identity is separate from him, and trying to get him to validate everything else that's going on in our lives. The Christian life is all about us coming to him and putting him first and instead letting him shape the entire fabric of our lives and every part of every day in which we live. I chose a different translation for this first because it really made me stop and think, you must give up your own way. That's the kind of people that we're to be, people who say, I'm going to stop and give up my own way because Jesus is the one who's meant to be in control of this changed life that he's brought forward in my life. It's not a spiritual spasm. It's not a one-time emotional event. It's every day I get up and I work on making Jesus greater and I work on making me lesser. And when it comes to bearing fruit, which is a verse that Paul puts forward in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, this is the kind of things that we're supposed to be seeing popping up in our lives. He says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the kind of people that we're to be. This is the kind of way that we're supposed to be patterning our lives. When I think about what discipleship looks like, One of the things that has always affected me is people who have had a deep hunger for God's word. I know that people will always say, okay, Brian, you're going to be telling us to read our Bibles again. We all know that that's going to be happening, but it's true. When a friend of mine first became a follower of Jesus, uh, he was a full-time builder, and he quit his job because he said, if we really believe that this book is God speaking to us, if I really believe that this is God's love letter to me, then I have got to get to know what this is all about. I have got to get to know what's in here. And so he, he quit his job, and every day he made it his full-time job to read as much as he could of the Bible until he either had to fall asleep or eat. And people have heard that story when, whenever John's told it, and even Christians have gathered around him and they said, you know, John, that's really irresponsible. You know, you shouldn't have given up your job. That wasn't the right thing to do. You know, I, you know afterwards he went back to work, so everything was fine on that side of things. But I've always been amazed at his example because he took the whole thing seriously. And, and it it puts me to shame. It puts everyone that I know to shame because I think if we really treated this book as God speaking to us, we would probably make some choices differently on a daily basis with how we worked with it, with how we understand it, with how eager we were to get into it. And I also think of what's coming up ahead as well, too. What's coming up very soon is we're going to be celebrating Mother's Day, right? What do we celebrate with a Mother's Day, you're celebrating your mom, you're celebrating the person 
who loves you the most. You're celebrating the person who cares about you the most. You're celebrating the person whose voice has guided you and helped you the most. My goodness, like my, our son's mom, like she does so much for our kids. They would be so lost if they were just stuck with their dad. Oh my goodness, it would be such a bad picture. But they need their mom to survive. They need their mom for everything. But think about how we think about that as well, too. In, in one of the passages in the Psalms, God describes his voice coming to us like that of a loving mother. Like, imagine what your life would have turned out like if you were born, if you were a baby, if you were an infant, if then you grew up to be like a, a young kid and then a teenager and all the way up to the 18 years old. And through that whole process of 18 years old, you didn't listen to your mother at all. You didn't do a thing that she said. I mean, I can speak of this, especially for my own mother, but my life would be in really bad shape if I did that. Also, don't do that. Listen to your mom at all times. But if that's just our mother's voice, imagine how much more we need God's voice in our life. And we stifle that when we put our Bibles to the side and when we don't engage with them. It's at the heart of discipleship. It's at the heart of how we change. And, and God has given us all the people in our church as well as a resource to help each other to change, to help each other to grow along too. Uh, there's some people who do an amazing job just with reading on their own. And for other people, they do things uh, like working through things as a group, as a team. Uh, our ladies' Bible study on Tuesday nights, my goodness, like the room is getting packed out because all these ladies are coming, all different different stages of life and ages, all these different types of things. And for some people, that's the best place where they grow, where they can grow as disciples. Um, at our church, we have uh, elders as well, too. If you're a young man, you're like, I'm not going to go to the ladies' Bible study. But we have elders. These are guys who are all from vastly different backgrounds, stages of life, different life experiences. And you can all learn a lot from them. You can all be discipled by them in different ways as a resource to strengthen you and to help you along in our journey. Well, this is how God has gifted us with each other. Paul talks about it in those terms. He has gifted us with every other person who is part of the family of God that he's planted you and placed you in. One thing that we will do is we will come next to the Lord's Supper because this is the place where all of this change was made possible. If it wasn't for the cross, we would still be hanging under the weight of our sin. If it wasn't for the cross, there would be no change happening in our lives at all. And if it wasn't for the cross, we would all still be spiritually dead. And for that, that's the reason enough on a weekly basis why we come to the cross in communion and why we say thank you to Jesus for going there for us. So let's take a minute to pray. We'll have a moment to be quiet before God, and I'll guide us as we take the Lord's Supper together. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who wants to move into our lives and complete a full renovation of the heart. You are a God who loves us so much that you are willing to die for us. And not only that, but you continue every single day to be gracious to us, to be merciful to us, and to keep helping us and instilling joy in us as we walk along the way in this journey of faith that you've created for us. Lord, we take a few moments like you've asked us to, to remember what you've done for us on the cross. We do that every week because you've asked us to remember the price that you would pay for all of us out of your great love for us. And so today it's our prayer that we would honor you, not just as we take communion, but we honor you by allowing you to continue changing us each day of the week. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'll give you a second to open your communion supplies. You guys have them there with you. 
And I'll turn to our communion passage today as it comes to us in Matthew's Gospel. For many people, communion and Lord's Supper is a very solemn thing. Uh, For other people, as they've told me and taught me along with it as well too, for some people, they've said it's a time of quiet and reserved joy because when they reflect upon the cross, they reflect upon this being the place where their sin was dealt with forever, and then because of that, they could enjoy God forever. And so no matter what your mindset is, whether this is a quiet in solemn time, or whether it's a time of quiet joy for you, uh, what we're also going to be able to do is respond in worship after we have communion uh, so that we can let that joy loose in gratitude for everything Jesus has done for us. And so as Jesus took the bread, he held the bread and said, this is my body, uh, which is given for every one of you. Take this in remembrance of me. So let's take this bread together at this time. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Even as Jesus was looking ahead to the cross, he was looking past it of the ultimate and forever joy that we would enjoy with him in heaven as we would celebrate his victory together. So let's take this in remembrance of him. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who loves change. We thank you that you are a God who continues to show up in surprising ways in the lives of people around us. Lord, we recognize that there's weakness within ourselves. Sometimes we feel like we don't have all the answers. Sometimes we feel like we don't really know how to always point people and to direct people. But Lord, we also have your spirit who's at work. And he's always surprising us and doing amazing things in the hearts of people around us. Lord, will you surprise us in a new way by seeing elements of your grace, elements of your forgiveness in the conversations that we have with people. Lord, we pray for those around us who are close to us. We pray for the families. We pray for the friends. We pray for the co-workers of each of us who are here today, of all the people that we are surrounded by closely, so that we can reflect Jesus and be an example of his love and reflect him well to everyone around us. And we pray that they will see the change that's evident in us and that that change will be so attractive that they will ask questions and seek, to have, and seek to have Jesus as well too. We thank you for this. We thank you for the cross. We thank you that we get to worship you today with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's just respond together in song and why don't you stand with me? Take the bread of life. Bro- 
Christy, for leading us again. Well, this morning as we close, uh, my prayer for each of us uh, this week is that this is a week where we will know that every day as you wake up, that you will step into the grace, love, and complete forgiveness of God every single day. And if you're still doubting, if you're still asking questions, if you're still not sure about it, then you can also trust and know that Jesus is just one step away from you in that moment and in that time. Well, I pray that these words fill you with hope as our service does today, so you have a great week together knowing and loving Jesus. Have a great week. Where I used to be